<laughs> Scared stiff is to fear something that you cannot see, and to feel its warmth is a true living hell. In July of 1993, I had purchased a trailer home in a small town just north of Baton Rouge. There I was, all alone, 18 years old and feeling totally lost. My father had just died the month before, and I was numb as a stone. I began fixing up the place, picking up knickknacks here and there, trying to make it cozy. One day while shopping at the flea market, I came across the most unusual set of Tahitian mugs. I had to have them. They had all different looks on their carved faces, yet all had the expression of what I felt inside. Hurt, mad, and pissed off at the world. Yes, I thought, they were definitely coming home with me. I know a bargain when I see one. The shopkeeper explained where they had come from. A man in town who owned a bar had gotten into a brawl one night and met an untimely demise. Afterwards, his wife closed it down and got rid of everything inside. So okay, I'm back home with them and I display them on my bookshelf with so much pride, always wondering why is it that my guests aren't quite as pleased with my new selection as I am, and I actually saw a couple of them turn their noses up. Well, taste is all just a matter of opinion, right? It wasn't long after that that I started having a lot of very weird things happen to me and anyone who came to visit. Sleeping in the living room, I could feel warmth behind me. When in the bedroom, the warmth was always right in front of the doorway, and every now and then, I would hear like a creaking like someone was walking. I always blew it off as part of my imagination though. As the death of my father started to really sink in, I started drinking alcohol very heavily. One or two bottles a day of cheap wine just to get to sleep at night. All the while, I am becoming more aware that something is not right here. The creaks are louder and I begin to feel something hovering over my shoulder in the daytime. Then my ex came to town and moved in. I told him about some of the things that I had felt and observed. He listened, yet looked at me like I was simply crazy, but his opinion soon changed. One night, a couple of months later, I was visiting at my mother's and decided to stay the night because it was raining so hard, I didn't want to get on the road. He was alone, back at the house, and when I called him on the phone to tell him I wouldn't be home that night, he said, I really want you to come over here. I've been hearing noises all night and it sounds like a man talking. And then right after he said that, I heard through the other end of the phone something slammed the window and he started screaming, you better get over here right now. I finally got up and worked my way to the car and hauled Hightail out of there. That same night, we had a kidnapping report filed on us because I was so hysterical of fear that a passerby walked up beside me in a parking lot and I almost had heart failure. On top of all that, there were more events. Several times, I heard knocking on my front door, only to discover that there was no one there when I answered. My boyfriend heard me calling his name when I was at the other end of the house. At times I would see, from the corner of my eye, a large black figure. On other occasions, I'd see a small animal that looked like a rabbit or cat running behind furniture. Sometimes I even saw a book get thrown a few feet across the room by something that wasn't there. And when I decided to get rid of these damn things, the Tahitian mugs, one came up missing. I looked all over for it and it was nowhere to be found. At the advice of my family, they said they knew it had to be these things causing me all this grief. I searched frantically with no luck. I desperately wanted all of them out of the house and once and for all. Finally, six months later, I found the lost muck in the exact place it should have been. I remember seeing the dust ring that day as I reached up on the shelf to take it down. I had a bad feeling about carrying this thing anywhere, but I decided that I had no choice but to get rid of it. Well, I had a flat tire the next day. Getting rid of the mugs were not as easy as I thought it would be. I took them back to the store where I bought them from the same lady that acted like she didn't know who I was. She insisted that was not where I bought them, and more than that, she refused to take them back. I begged her and told her I didn't want the money. I didn't even want a credit. I finally left the store with the lady, open mouthed, holding the box of mugs. I thought she must have known something. About three years ago, 
my mother's next door neighbor was murdered. And at the estate sale, my mom picked up the exact type mug and said, Tiffany, look at this. Her husband had committed suicide a few years earlier in the same house. Coincidence? Connected? Don't ask me, but I can give you one piece of advice. Before you walk across the next gravestone or buy or sell that pretty plate at the flea market, you must show some respect for the dead. When I was 17 years old, my grandmother, who had lived with us all my life, had died. And although there were many unusual events before and after her death, the most unusual occurrence involving my grandmother's death occurred the evening following her burial. My grandmother's funeral had been a trying thing for all of us. My mother was an only child who had never had the opportunity to know her father, and I am sure that the fact that her husband, my father, was stationed at Vietnam and the fact that she could not get into contact with him through the Red Cross only made matters worse. My grandmother was a much-loved and well-respected woman whose life and death touched many people, and the outpouring of sympathy, the flowers and cards, the visits by friends and relatives proved to be almost overwhelming for my mother. Her grief and confusion was so oppressive that, following my grandmother's funeral and burial in the family cemetery, she confessed to me, my younger sisters of 16 and 13, and my baby brother of 4, that she could not bear to deal with all the people who would be coming to the house that afternoon. She suggested that we go to a restaurant, pick up a bucket of chicken, and go on a picnic. We did exactly that. Dressed in the same clothes we had worn to the funeral, we went on a family picnic, just the five of us, remembering and talking about the woman who had meant so much to each and every one of us. We stayed away from our house till just after dark, and when we were sure that no one was visiting, we entered the house and got ready for bed, as we were all exhausted, both physically and emotionally. The following story was related to me by my mother and sisters the next morning. I was asleep in my very bed, in which my grandmother died. My sisters were sleeping together in their bed, and my baby brother was asleep in my mother's bed. My mother, who had insomnia, was lying in bed and reading. At around 2.30 in the morning, my 16-year-old daughter got out of bed and was heading to the bathroom when she ran screaming to my mother's room and told her that my grandma was sitting on the couch in the living room. She told my mother that they made a mistake and that our grandmother wasn't dead and that they had brought her home. My mother calmly explained that we all missed our grandmother and that my sister had been dreaming that our grandmother was dead. As my mother tried to calm her down, my other sister came running into my mother's room and said that my grandmother was in the living room. My mother now had two excited girls to deal with and explained that my oldest sister had a dream and that the younger girl had heard them discussing that dream. She explained that my youngest sister had a dream of her own after hearing that discussion, but both my sisters were adamant and my mother was forced to take them into the living room and prove to them that they were mistaken. My mother got out of her bed and walked down the hall and into the living room where she, herself, saw my grandmother sitting on the couch. My mother simply stood and stared at her mother, the woman who had been buried earlier that day, the woman who sat calmly on the couch and smiled at her and my two sisters. My mother says that her first thought was one of joy, that my sisters were correct in their belief that my grandmother had not died. Her next thought was pragmatic and sober. Her mother was indeed dead, and what she was seeing was a figment of her overwrought imagination. A figment. Brought on by a stale mass of hypnosis, she shared with my sisters in their dreams. As she stood there, my four-year-old brother came walking out of her bedroom and into the living room. Half asleep and rubbing his eyes, he asked why was everyone awake in the middle of the night. At about the same time he asked this question, he looked across the living room in the direction of the couch. Throwing his arms out in front of him, my four-year-old brother yelled Mama and went running across the room towards the couch. My mother relates at this point, my grandmother smiled and simply faded away. I was not a witness to the preceding story, but the same tale is told by my mother and two sisters as to what happened on the night of my grandmother's burial. My brother does not remember the events of that evening, as he was only four years old and too young to appreciate the unique circumstances involving a visit from the dead. Thank you for reading. I was a student at a small university in Illinois. One night, 
My two friends and I were really bored. It was a late weekend night, so studying was out of the question. We decided to go out and play a childish game of hide and seek. We set out for the field in between the dorms and music building. Being left as the seeker, I quickly found one of my friends, Lynette, hiding underneath a tree, a story in its own right. Laughing over her antics, we realized that we hadn't found Crystal. We stood there, a moment, looking around as to where she might be. We spotted a person walking along the path on the outside of the field, heading towards the music building. The figure was all in black, or what also looked like a shadow. Deciding this was Crystal, we walked slowly to ambush her. Now, the building that Crystal was heading to had two entrances on opposite sides. When going through one door, you can walk straight through to the other. Crystal walked into one of the doors. We decided that Lynette would go into the building on the other side scare her, and as Lynette escaped out the other door, I would scare her too. As I'm waiting outside, freezing my you-know-what off, I hear someone start practicing scales on their trumpet. I thought nothing of it. It was a music building after all. A few minutes later, the door opened, and Lynette was running down the stairs. Where's Crystal? I asked. She looked really pale and was shaking. Can you hear the trumpet player? Wondering why she was asking me about the trumpet player, I responded, yeah, so? Well, I was upstairs following who I thought to be Crystal. I couldn't see her when she went around the corner, and when I rounded the corner is when I heard the trumpet. She took a breath. Well, I went to the only practice room with the light on to go say hi to the person so I wouldn't scare them with my footsteps, and when I got to the room, no one was there. Cal, I mean no one but the trumpet music was right in front of my face. I felt the air. She grabbed my arm, actually pulled me in the direction of the dorms. When we got around to the front of the music building, I looked up to the second story windows, the practice rooms. In one of the rooms, the light was on, revealing a yellow room. The practice rooms are painted all blue, and right in front of the window was a shadow, Arms upheld with a gleaming gold trumpet in his hands, the sounds of the scales falling to us below. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't scared, but more enthralled. In the few seconds that I had stood mesmerized, the shadow stopped playing and turned and bent its head down to us. I couldn't help but stare back. What seemed like a few minutes only lasted a second. He once again picked up his trumpet and practiced his scales. I wanted to go back to the building and go upstairs to see him, but Lynette was about to tear my arm off of my body. I remember her saying over and over again on the cold walk back to the dorms that there was no one in there. So where was Crystal? She found a great hiding place. We found her in the room watching TV. I could have killed her. When I was very young, my father recanted to me the tale of Murder Road an old bridge out in the boonies about 10 miles south of my hometown. For my own story to make sense, I'd better summarize the story of Murder Road for you, the ever-faithful readers. It's been a good 20 years since that event occurred, although I'm not sure of the exact date. Found by the bridge, in an old car, were the bodies of four unfortunate individuals who, by some cruel twist of fate, had been brutally murdered. All four, a family from out of town, had been shot in close range and left in their vehicle. The crime was never solved. A crime such as this is probably no big deal to folks from New York or Detroit or other big cities where murders are unfortunately too common, but in Ottawa, Kansas, population now 12,000, it's a different story. Since my youth, I've been fascinated by this place and the story behind it, and once I was old enough to drive, I made frequent trips to the spot, always alone, usually during the day. It's a heck of a creepy place at night, if you know the story behind it. As my years and my bravery grew, it became common for me to venture to the spot after dark, although usually with high beams on and windows up. It took a lot of guts for me to finally bring myself to stop the vehicle, but I never got out of the car. I was making it a pretty routine trip by July of 97. It was a good place to be alone and think. There wasn't much traffic. I approached the bridge and got the usual chills as I got close. The area is pretty much open fields until you reach the bridge, where a thick grove of trees rises up on either side of the small stream that runs through, 
making it darker and somehow more sinister on the bridge itself. I pulled off to the side of the road, no more than six feet from the bridge. I dropped my seat back and closed my eyes, relaxing. Only a few moments later, there was a tap on my window. My eyes flew open and I sat bolt upright. There was a scraggly looking man outside and he looked none too pleased with me. Out of the car, he mouthed. Terrified, I complied. Turn around, he whispered, and put your hands in the car. I did as I was told. It was unseasonably chilly out, and a light rain had started down. I began to shiver, but more out of fear than anything else. I gasped as something cold and hard was pressed into my neck. From my right came a terrified scream, and I glanced over. In the corner of my eye, I saw a black car, its bumper touching mine. The driver's side window was shattered, and a lifeless body was slumped over the steering wheel. I wanted to scream, but the cold metal of the gun on my neck kept me quiet. There was a sudden, harsh gust of wind through the trees, and the pressure on my neck vanished. I whirled around, my heart thumping powerfully. There was no one there. The car was gone too. Needless to say, I was out of there in a flash. It was some time later before what had happened really hit me. I had nightmares for weeks. I still go out there, although not as much. I assumed that I was just out on a bad night, but I won't be there again in July. Thanks for reading. This tale is still very disturbing to me, since it involves my father, who had passed away almost 10 years before the occurrence. My wife and I usually have friends over on a Saturday night. This particular Saturday night happened to be in the month of October, which is a special month for my wife Jamie and my son DJ. It also happens to be a special time for John and Sonia, our friends. We love to sit around and scare each other with chilling ghost stories. On this one particular Saturday night in 1994, we all gathered around my kitchen table to listen to our friend Sonia tell some very eerie tales passed down from her family. We did have a Ouija board to use, but by the time she was done telling her tales, I was shaking so much that I broke the board over my head and threw it away, outside and into the garbage. The conversation of ghosts prompted me to talk about my dead father. In no uncertain terms, I made it clear that I did not miss him at all because he was a mean, rotten man in life. I went so far as to say that if I ever saw his ghost, I would tell him so. Sonia told me not even to joke that way. It's an open invitation to evil, and I should repent immediately. I only laughed and got more bold, demanding an appearance so I could tell him how I feel. My wife and Sonia were so upset, I decided to stop. Later that night, after everyone had gone home, my wife and I went to sleep. My son was already out like a light. I must admit, laying there in the dark, I was fairly spooked. Finally, sleep came, but I was awoken at 3 a.m. by a steady and repetitive thumping noise. Thump, then silence for three seconds, then another thump, over and over and over. I lay there paralyzed with fear. What could this noise be? I tried to rationalize anything, even wake my wife, but I was too scared to move. Yet, the thump continued, only it was getting louder and louder and louder. I finally realized that I have family to protect, and using all my strength on courage, I got out of bed to investigate. My wife remained in a deep sleep. As I walked through the hall in the dark, I noticed that the kitchen light was on. Hadn't I turned that off? Fearing the unknown, I snuck into my son's room for a baseball bat, which somehow didn't erase my fear. I was almost at the kitchen now, close to an hour after hearing the first thumps. Yes, the noise was coming from the kitchen. Sweat formed on my forehead, and I was shaking like an autumn leaf. I entered the kitchen and turned to the left, where our table sat. I wanted to scream and run in terror, but I was paralyzed. There, at the far chair, sat my father. Ten years dead, yet there he was. His right hand raised and came down with a fist on the kitchen table. Thump. That was the noise that I've heard for the past hour. He was looking directly into my eyes, yet his were dead. He stared right through me, 
then opened his mouth and spoke in a voice I never in my life wished to hear again. Stop. Stop talking about me. Then he slammed his fist down in one final violent thump. The kitchen light went out. I let out a gasp as my heart sank and I quickly turned the light on again, but he was gone. I caught my breath and turned on every light I could find. An hour later, laying in bed, I wondered, had I dreamt the whole event? The next morning, my wife, Jamie, was up before me. She came in and woke me up and asked me if I had forgotten to turn the lights off before coming to bed. I told her I had. She asked me to come into the kitchen and look at something strange, and I almost screamed. I slowly followed her into the kitchen, trying to hide my fear. She pointed to the very chair where my father had sat only a few hours earlier. I then knew it wasn't a dream. Look at that, she said. Where did all that dirt on that chair come from? It was true. There was a thin layer of dirt on the chair and on the floor surrounding it. I muttered some excuse, and to this day, I've never told my family or friends of this occurrence, and I've never spoken ill of the dead since. Hey guys, it's Phantom of Darkness again, here to close you out. Now, before I get into anything silly, I'm just going to start off with something serious because I think it's important for you guys to understand, but I know in light of recent events that there's been some tragedies that have been occurring, and this happens every day to normal people, whether you're a celebrity or not, but I just really wanted to emphasize how important it is to talk to people if you're struggling mentally and you have issues emotionally and you don't know how to cope with life, you know? There's many resources that you have at your disposal, no matter what country you live in, I'm sure you have very valuable resources that you can seek out if you're struggling with depression and you're not really sure how to handle things. You know, truly don't be afraid to express yourself and feel the way you want to feel when it comes to actually interacting with other people about your emotions and being upfront about how you honestly feel about yourself. Because getting help is the most important thing to getting your mind right mentally and, of course, emotionally. And if you feel like you don't have that strong support system, just fine. You can talk to me even if you're struggling, you know, for a little bit. I respond on Twitter all the time. I like to talk to my subscribers. I mean, I can't say I can always respond adequately, but, you know, if that helps you, I uh, think if you have nobody else to turn to and if you want to say something to me, you know, shoot me a comment and I'll respond back, you know. But um, anyway, guys, sorry to sound so sobering and so depressing and all this, but, you know, I think love is really important and I think we need to be able to support each other and reach out to others, especially if you're struggling and during times of hard grief and whatnot. So anyway, guys, please remember to comment, like, subscribe and share this video because I really enjoyed making this video particularly. There was a lot of good stories in this, but uh, I don't want to take up more of your time, guys. So I'll just sayonara like I always do and leave. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, I love you guys and good night, good morning, and I'll see you in the next video.